1 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we left off last week. So let's pause and once again, let's, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our, our time in His Word. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to freely gather here tonight to open up your word and to seek your face together. We pray you'll speak to us now through the pages of Scripture. We love you and we give you all praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So if you've been with us for uh, a, a few weeks now in 1 Timothy, you should know the key verse and the main point by now. And here it is out of chapter 3 that although Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so with that in mind, uh, we're making a list together of things that should define the church. As we go through 1 Timothy, it's kind of a handbook for how the church should be run. Uh, the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus are called the pastoral epistles. And for a reason, because Paul is writing to Timothy and to Titus as pastors of local churches, Timothy pastors the church in Ephesus, about how to conduct God's household, how the church should be managed and how it should be run and how it should be uh, overseen. And so in our list so far, we've looked at three things, that the church should be about sound doctrine. We shouldn't be adding to Scripture. We shouldn't be subtracting from Scripture. We shouldn't be omitting Scripture. We should be applying Scripture to our lives, that it is His, God's relevant truth to every generation. And so it is His timeless truth for us even today. It should also be a place of grace. Paul writes in chapter 1 about how he was the worst of all sinners. He was a blasphemer. He was a violent man. He was a persecutor. And yet he says how the Lord ministered his grace to him. And as a recipient of God's grace, Paul says, in part, God did this for me so that others could look at my messed up life and see what God's done for me that you might be encouraged he could do a similar thing for you. And the church should be that place of grace where people come in, you know, all of us messed up, all of us sinners. You know, listen, normal is only a setting on your dryer, friends, okay? We, we all have sin issues. We all have problems. There's none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. We, we are all sinners. We are all in desperate need of grace. And we should be able to come to church and understand what sin is. You know, Paul, Paul says, when he wrote to the Romans, he says, I didn't know what covetousness was, using one thing as an example, except that the law said, do not covet. He said, I didn't even understand some things that were right and wrong until Scripture pointed it out to me. And then once I became aware of sin and I realized my own sinful condition, then I understand my need for grace. And God is a loving Father who wants to forgive us and He wants to shower His grace upon us We can't really receive His grace until we first acknowledge our own sinful condition. Now, the rest of the world's going to say, I'm okay, you're okay. But the truth is, the Bible says none of us is okay. Okay? That's why we need the Lord. Okay? And, And therefore, when we receive Him as our Savior and His cleansing work in our lives, we can be the recipients of God's grace, His unmerited favor, that acronym of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so God is a good God, and He loves to forgive us and cleanse our hearts and bring us into relationship with Him. So the church should be a place of grace. You know, I I know that some churches are a place of guilt, all right? Um, I, I had one lady, she didn't go to our church anymore, but I had one lady say to me almost every Sunday, preach them, Preach it, preach it, preach it, brother. Preach it and, and, and make, make it sound like you're saying, sick them to a bulldog. Just, I don't know, just because some people like to feel like they've been stepped on. But it shouldn't just be a place of guilt. It should be a place of grace. We need grace. Amen? Who needs grace? I need grace. All right. Amen. And it should also be a place of prayer. God's house should be a place of prayer. And Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 2, And he talks about making prayers and requests, intercession for everyone, especially for kings and all those in authority that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So pray for everyone, but especially for our leaders. 
Then in the rest of chapter two, and we got into this last week, and so I'm not gonna spend too much time, but I wanna pick up where we left off. Uh, Paul begins to speak in chapter two about some distinguishing things between men and women and the, the various roles within the local church. And so we had three points from last week, and so just summarizing the latter part of chapter two, how starting in verse eight, men are called by God to set the spiritual example everywhere that he first starts with men and he says, all right, now listen, step up to the plate, be godly men, loving leaders, examples of Christ uh, in the home and then in this context in the church. And so he talks about how men should lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing there in verse eight. And then in the rest of the verses in chapter two, he addresses the women and just summarizing again some of his points. Number two, that a woman's real beauty is not defined by outer appearance, but by an inner relationship with Christ. That's important to understand. And, and then number three, he also talks here just summarizing about how a woman is free to use her gifts throughout the church. But there is this lone prohibition about teaching and in particular laying down doctrine slash having authority in the church that God has reserved for men as pastors and elders. I, I appreciate that I got a few emails that were very encouraging, and I got zero emails that were um, upset with me. And even though you might have been upset with me, you refrained from emailing me, and I appreciate that. And as I said last week, if you're upset, listen, don't, don't shoot the messenger, okay? Send your emails to Jesus at heaven.com because that's... <laughs> that this really is coming from, from the Lord. Now, listen, I, 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 I want to address then two common objections to some of this, because some people, again, and, and one, of the, one of the things that is, you know, at odds with Scripture, as I pointed out last week, is, is the cultural approach to, uh, to uh, issues of men and women and gender differences, because again, as I said last week, there's, there's this real effort afoot to uh, just make everything and everybody gender neutral. And we're so confused, we don't even know anymore what bathrooms to use. That's, that's how bad it's gotten. And, and so just because God distinguishes unique traits and qualities and roles and responsibilities between men and women, don't think this is antiquated stuff. He is honoring and valuing each gender, but he, he has determined by his prerogative to assign certain responsibilities to men and, and certain things to women. So I, I don't want any woman to feel devalued or less than a man as a result of reading through some of these things. Um, you are to use your gifts for the glory of God, and especially in this area of teaching, you can still, again, Titus 2 commands a woman to teach younger women. You can teach children. You have influence with other godly people in your life that you can train up in the ways of the Lord. But there's this area, and again, this is a departure from what some churches will teach you in regards to pastors and elders, those having authority in the church, being reserved for men. This is just God's prerogative. Now, as we talk about this, I wanna raise, because we don't wanna just dance around anything here, so we try to address head on even the objections. We left off last week talking about two typical common objections to this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter two. The first one is, some people would say, well, this is Paul's opinion because he says, I do not permit. And, and, and that is the language there in verse 12, where he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. Again, this is in relation to laying down doctrine and being in a position of authority in the church. Now, if you compare that verse, however, with chapter 1, verse 1, and that's why I also listed that there on the screen for you, it's pretty clear in chapter 1, 1 that Paul says, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. So it's pretty clear that he begins the letter by saying, I'm writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So even though he writes in the first person in verse 12, it is clear from the beginning of this letter that he is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So this is coming from the Lord, not just the pen of Paul. The other common objection to this is this whole idea of this is first century advice, as Paul does right here in the first century, 
but that times have changed. And it's as if Paul anticipates this objection because, again, by inspiration, he's going to write here in verses 13 and 14 about Adam and Eve. So what he ends up doing is he goes all the way back from, to, the, to the original design and the original creation story with Adam and Eve, and he begins to talk about here God's original intent and design for the home, and again in this context for the church as it relates to male and female roles. Now I will tell you why some people will object using the second argument and it's very similar to the common debate right now related to the U.S. Constitution. Some people will argue about the Bible the same way that there's a common argument today about the U.S. Constitution. And I know you've all heard this debate. This debate about the U.S. Constitution, is it a living document? that should change and, and be interpreted uh, differently according to modern uh, new ideas. Okay, that's one school of thought, that the U.S. Constitution is a living document that can change based on cultural changes. Or is it a static document? That is to say, should the Constitution be interpreted based on the original intent of the founders? Okay, and so that's the debate. Now, you know, you, you can fall in, in whatever camp you prefer. Uh, I, I remember hearing once uh, when Justice Scalia was still alive and he was uh, lecturing at Princeton University and he, he, he made a joke, it wasn't really true, but he said when school children, and he clarified it later, but he said, when school children come to the Supreme Court, and, and I hear them, when I ask them a question about what's their, what's their idea about the U.S. Constitution, he said, many children say that it's a living document, because that's what they're learning in school. And Scalia said, I tell them over and over again, it's not a living document, it's dead, dead, dead. <laughs> and then he clarified, he says, I don't really say it like that. But he says, that, that's, that's what I believe, and that's what I uh, believe is, is important in terms of the original intent behind the founders and the document, that, that it is, and, and Scalia, I had the privilege of meeting Scalia once. He was pounding down some sliders and washing it down with, with wine, but that's another story for another day. Anyway, true story. Um, but uh, what, what Scalia's angle was, was that, listen, this is, this is an enduring, he liked the word enduring versus living. It's an enduring document. But, but it doesn't change just because culture changes. We have to understand original intent and design. I personally lean towards that as the original uh, intent behind the interpretation of the Constitution, and that's my bent on the Bible, okay? The Bible doesn't change because culture changes. It's an enduring document. It's an enduring Word of God. Now, it is the living Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 talks about it as a living Word of God. It's the living document. But it's in the sense of not that it is altering based on changes in culture, but in, in the sense that it's a living Word of God, enduring Word of God, because it constantly addresses the human heart regardless of what generation you come from because we have the similar issue at hand, which is we're all sinners in need of a Savior, Jesus is a Savior, God so loved the world that He gave His Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for you and me. So in that sense, it's living because it, it doesn't expire. That message and that truth is relevant for all generations and for all time. So it is the living Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, but Peter would write in 1 Peter 1.23 that it is the living and enduring Word of God. And for that reason, we shouldn't look at Scripture through a cultural lens. We need to look at Scripture in terms of what is God's original intent and design behind what He's saying. And, and therefore, when you look at it through that lens, you realize that because God is a loving Father, He doesn't disparage either gender. He values each gender, and He values and esteems men for who men are and women for who women are. And He says, now listen, in order to keep a certain uh, order within a family and a structure within the church, this is how I've designed uh, men in terms of stepping up to the plate and assuming some leadership here and being godly examples. Now, let me frame it for you this way, uh, in case you're still a little struggling with, with some of this. Um, God calls all of us, if you're a Christ follower, God calls all of us 
to be an example of Christ in our world. True? True. All of us are to be an example of Christ in the world. In particular, God calls, in, in reference to the home and marriage, God calls husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Now, how did Christ supremely love his bride, the church? By dying for her. Okay, and Jesus would even say in John chapter 15, no greater love as a man, but that he would lay down his life for his friend. So the supreme sacrifice that Christ paid was to offer his life for all of us, to lay down his life. Now check this out. So men are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church and to be the ultimate example of the supreme example of Christ means that men should be willing to lay down their lives. The fact of the matter is, and this is going to sound stereotypical to some, but the fact of the matter is that men are wired to lay down their lives. There's honor and virtue in giving of a life. Now, obviously there are exceptions. There are cowards. There are men who are cowards. But in general, men are wired to lay down their lives. And we are all too familiar with the scenes of some gunman coming into a public room or a school or, or, or some venue, and typically, instinctively, men will throw themselves over women and children to protect them. Now, a woman will do that for her children, no question about that. But instinctively, a woman is not going to throw herself on her husband. That's laughable. It's true, unless she knows that she's married one of those cowards, and then she's like, I gotta protect you. So typically, typically, this is why it, it, it makes rational sense to us, who typically throws themselves in protecting others is gonna be a man protecting uh, women and children. Again, a woman will certainly do that for her children, but instinctively she won't do that for a man because God has hardwired men to protect and to throw themselves and to offer their lives. That's the supreme sacrifice. That's the example that Christ set for us in the ultimate way, and men are hardwired to do that, and as examples of Christ should be even more so willing to do that. Now. If a man then has 51% of the responsibility, okay, leadership 101 means that he needs authority commensurate with the responsibility. So if a man is called by God to be that guy who will ultimately lay down his life, then he has 51% of the responsibility, and thus he should get some authority commensurate with that responsibility. So the reality is 1 Timothy chapter 2 is not given to us, not intended to be unfair to women. It's intended to be fair to men. It is saying, listen, you guys have to step up to the plate and be loving spiritual leaders in the home, in the church, even to the point of laying down your life if you really want to follow the supreme example of Christ. And so commensurate with that comes some authority, God says. I'm going to call you to a higher level of responsibility, and with that, I'm going to give you a measure of authority commensurate with that responsibility. So then what God does here through Paul into chapter 3 is he says, now, here's how men who are called to positions of responsibility and authority are to be qualified. And so, again, as it relates to the church, and I want to clarify that again, and I said it last week, but I just want to make mention. In talking about roles, responsibilities, authority, that isn't to say that women don't make excellent CEOs, women can be great prime ministers or presidents of countries, um, and in management positions, but for the structure of the church and a home, God says, I, I've ordained a certain responsibility and a certain authority between men and women. But then now, calling men to this accountability, he goes through a list through the pen of Paul concerning elders slash pastors in the church. So if you look at chapter 3 now, let me read the first seven verses where, where Paul writes this. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, circle the word overseer, some of your Bibles say on being a, a bishop, the office of a bishop. 
He desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. And he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Okay, pause there for a moment with me. He begins to talk now in this next section. Here's number four on our list of things that should define the church, godly elders and deacons. Uh, we stopped right before he starts to talk about deacons, so we'll get to that probably next week. But for the rest of, of tonight, we're going to talk about being what it means to be a godly elder, what it means to be uh, called by God to step up to the plate and be a responsible leader in the local church. And the word elder here is translated uh, overseer in the NIV or bishop in the King James, uh, but it is the Greek word episkopos. Uh, so wherever in the NIV, in verse 1, it uses the word overseer, verse 2, it uses the word overseer, that's the word episkopos. We get our English word episcopal. The, uh, the Episcopalian structure, that denomination, uh, that name came from this Greek word episkopos, and it means elder or bishop, but it's actually from two Greek words, epi. Now, when epi is used as a prefix on a word, it, what it means is that the, the word that follows has intensity. And so it's two words, epi, and then the next word is skopos. And skopos means to watch or to look at or to oversee. We get English words like microscope, uh, telescope, okay, being able to see. And so episcope, uh, episcopos, epi and skopos means uh, uh, one who looks at or over something intently. And in this context, it's talking about the church. So an overseer, or again, some translations of bishop, we're talking about the word elder here, is one who is assigned the responsibility of overseeing, of watching intently, caring for God's church. And in a local church, this is, this is God's bride, this is, uh, this is His church, and so God calls pastors and elders to help oversee and to help care for the flock. Now, just by way of distinction, if you'll go uh, further in 1 Timothy chapter 5, just look real quickly in your Bibles to chapter 5, I want to point out a verse because I want to distinguish something here uh, for, for our understanding. So in, in chapter 5, verse 17, it says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Okay, so note that. What, what I want to point out with you is that it talks about elders who direct the affairs of the church. That's one kind of elder. Are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Now, that's another kind of elder. So what Paul is saying here is that in the early church, there were elders who were more administrative elders who were helping to oversee the affairs, directing the affairs of the church administratively. And then there were elders whose main responsibility were to preach and teach. So those are, those are more of the ministerial elders. So you have administrative elders and you have ministerial elders. Now, just, just as we're going through this to help you understand a little bit about how we function here, um, and, and, and we always try to do the best we can. There's not, you know, trying to find and, and follow after the perfect church model. There's a lot of discussion about you know, church government uh, and a lot of uh, opinions about how churches should be managed and governed and overseen. You basically have churches that are congregationally run, where the congregation votes on everything. You have churches that are uh, run by a plurality of elders. You have churches uh, more like ours that are directed by a pastor but protected by elders. And so there are a variety of, of ways that churches can be managed and governed. Uh, and I'm not saying that other churches who do it differently than the way we do it are wrong. There are different ways to look at Scripture and to apply Scripture. Uh, but I'm going to tell you how we look at it and how we apply it here at Cornerstone. 
Um, basically, when you look at this verse here in chapter 517, we see these administrative elders and these ministerial elders. So listen to this statement. Let me be careful how I say this. Um, every pastor is an elder. Not every elder is a pastor. Okay? Every pastor is an elder. Not every elder is a pastor. What do I mean? Some elders are just uh, purely administrative. They don't, they don't have a calling for pastoral ministry, but they, but they are gifted and they, and they uh, um, are qualified based on what we're going to read in chapter 3, just as much as pastors are. But, but, there are, but their responsibility are more administratively, and pastors' responsibility are more ministerially. You know, just loving on the sheep and, and visiting the, the sick and doing weddings and funerals and teaching God's Word, preaching and teaching. And so here at Cornerstone, we have, we have a, a group of elders that, that I refer to as the Timothy Council. They're basically the church board. They have to qualify based on chapter 3, their personal lives. And then we have a pastoral staff that also qualify based on chapter 3. But the pastors don't engage in the administrative and financial matters and looking over, you know, how, how the, the money is being managed and, you know, accountability with all of that. And, and when we got into this building, you know, all the building plans and, and the church financing and all that, that was the administrative elders task of directing the affairs of the church. Our pastors, I wanted to make sure we're freed up to constantly be ministering to the spiritual needs of the flock. Okay, so even at Cornerstone, we have two types of elders, but both groups have to qualify according to chapter 3. So if you'll go back to chapter 3 now, I want you to take a look with me at what happens to be here, 15 qualifications. Now, I will, I will tell you this, there are 15, as we read the list, and you'll see when we go through it, there are 15. In the book of Titus, Paul's letter to Titus in chapter 1, he also gives qualifications for elders, and there are another 12. All told, there are 27 qualifications to be an elder. So when God calls certain men to, to take responsibility and leadership, you're talking 27 qualifications. This is no easy thing. And there are no perfect men. But to the degree that we are able and responsible, we need to live up to this list, okay? And so that's why he starts out by saying, you know, here's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. This is a noble thing, but this is a tall order. This is not for the faint of heart. Now, out of the 15, 14 are character issues. One is a gifting. And it's, and it's teaching. The other 14, 14 out of 15, are character issues. These are matters of the heart. There's only one that's a gifting issue. And even then, the gift of teaching doesn't necessarily mean that you can stand up in the pulpit. What it does mean, however, is that you are able to clearly, as an elder, discern between what is true doctrine and what is heresy. See, if, if I start, for example, just start preaching heresy and then invite you to start drinking some Kool-Aid, okay? There are a group of men around me that will rein me in and kick me out. Okay, well, yeah. Great, okay. That's... Well, I know what you meant, but that sounded really bad timing. Yes, praise God, but okay, but anyway. Thank you, thank you for helping me to stay humble. Anyhow, I'm gonna go through this. We only have a few minutes, so I might have to pick this up next week, but I'm gonna go five at a time, okay? And some of these are very self-explanatory. I'm not gonna really need to add any commentary to it because some of it is, is pretty self-explanatory. Here's the first five. The first is above reproach. That an elder or a pastor needs to be above reproach, meaning free from scandal. And we got enough scandals in the church. We don't need pastors to be bringing down God's church. So they should be free from scandal. Now, again, above reproach doesn't mean that they're perfect, but it means that, that the elder is someone about whom no credible charge or accusation can stick. Okay, uh, people will, you know, gossip and slander. Okay, you can't control that. 
But, you know, don't even entertain an accusation against an elder, the Bible says, unless brought by two or more. So where there's some, you know, corroboration, that there are some agreement about some things that are bad and wrong, now you have reproach. But otherwise, an elder is to be above reproach, free from scandal, and also to be the husband of one wife. Now, when Paul wrote this, here's what he's up against. In the first century in Rome, now this is, this is where it's important to understand context and culture, but you still don't t- change Scripture and adapt it to the culture, but it's important to understand the background. In first century Rome, the culture of the Roman Empire was this, that every man should have one wife to bear his legal children, one concubine for his pleasure, and one mistress for adventure. Hey! Hey! Another inappropriate bad timing, (laughs) amen. Now, um, pray for that brother right there. That's the guy whose wife will throw herself over his body right there. Yeah, that's right. I know it's all in jest, okay. So that's the first century Roman Empire. That's their thinking, the mentality. Every man's like, I got to have one wife to bear my legal children, one concubine for my pleasure, one mistress for adventure. Paul's basically coming along here saying, no, 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 no. If you're going to be a pastor slash elder in the local church, you have to be a one woman man and you have to be committed to her. Now, by the way, this doesn't mean that he's required to be married. Some can look at this and say, okay, he has to be the, you know, the husband of one wife. That means that he must be married. That's not what he's saying. He's addressing the problem of polygamy in the culture, and he's saying that if you're going to be in a position of spiritual leadership, you need to be devoted to that one woman if you are married for the rest of your life and be faithful to her, okay? So he's addressing the issue of polygamy. He's not even excluding, by the way, men who might be divorced. If, in fact, their divorce had biblical grounds or they were divorced before they became a Christian. So we have to be careful in understanding what he's saying here. He's not excluding single men and he's not excluding divorced men. But he's saying if you are uh, married, you need to be committed to that woman for the rest of your life in a loving, monogamous relationship. And if you are divorced, you're not disqualified, but you need to have biblical grounds, or perhaps it happened before you became a Christian. In that case, everything is under the blood in in that case. So that's what he, so that's number two. Number three, he talks about being temperate. Now the ESV uses the word sober-minded. It's not really about alcohol here. He's gonna address alcohol later, Uh, but this is more about attitude and judgment, about being sober-minded in attitude and judgment. In other words, being circumspect in in his responsibilities, clear-headed and moderate in things. You know, not living in the extremes. Uh, But a pastor elder needs to be temperate, uh, not not living in extremes. And then, of course, self-control. You know, self-control, listen, that applies to all of us. I mean, uh, and you'll read through this list and you'll think to yourself, this is not just for elders and pastors. I mean, this is a good list for all of us to live up to. And being self-controlled is part of the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, you know, we uh, often, you know, esteem people who are, you know, self-made people. but, But the real people that God esteems are those who are under the control of the Spirit. And so we need to be people who are self-controlled, governing our passions and appetites uh, under the control of the Holy Spirit. Number five, uh, we are to be respectable. Elders and pastors are to be respectable. In other words, polite and courteous uh, and, uh, and to be men of honor, to be respectable. Um, so it's already like 14 after, and I, if I'm not going to be able to do justice to the rest of these. So why don't we uh, pause it there for tonight, and we'll continue with this list next week. So you can read ahead, and, uh, and we'll, we'll carry on with the qualifications next week. And now you can say amen. amen. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thanks for this time in your word, and we just always want our lives to be modeled after Scripture, and some parts of Scripture are easier to obey than others, but all of it's good, Lord, and and I thank you for uh, just men and women and young people here who just have a desire to grow in their faith and the knowledge of Scripture, and together, Lord, we, we just acknowledge that we're on a journey, and we just are constantly wanting you to shape us to refine us, uh, Lord, to uh, just do your good work in our hearts. 
And we thank you for your grace and your patience with us. And we just love you, Lord. This is your church. It, it's the bride of Jesus Christ, and we want to be tender with her. And we want to be careful, Lord, that we honor you because uh, we are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture, Lord. And so we love you and we thank you that you first loved us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen.